Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning as we turn to the pages of your word, I'm asking first of all that you would give me unusual clarity of thought because I always come to the word with a sinful human heart and I need a coal from heaven's altar and able to represent what the word says faithfully. I'm asking that you would forgive my sin and that you would make me fit to speak this morning. And that the words I speak, you would cover my mistakes, that you would cover me with the blood of Christ so that the only voice we truly hear by the time we're done is the voice of the Spirit prompting us to follow Jesus. And I'm asking for that blessing this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. I read this story the other day about a very, very successful man who had worked hard for a long time. Now he'd come to the end of a long and successful career, and it was time to sit back and enjoy the fruits of his labor, and that was something he deserved because he really was successful. He was so successful that when he got out of bed in the morning and looked out of his bedroom window, he owned everything he saw. I mean, he could not see past the bounds of his own property, and that's not because he was living on some massive spread in Texas, as impressive as that would be. That's small potatoes compared to what this man had accomplished because he could actually get on a horse and ride in any direction for three weeks and never leave his property because his name is Nebuchadnezzar, the man who conquered the whole known world of his day and gave us the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Now, he didn't build it all by himself. His dad got a running start at it. His dad managed to defeat the Assyrians who had been uh, attacking Babylon and sacking it over and over again. Dad got rid of the Assyrians, and now Nebuchadnezzar could build the empire. He took things a lot further than dad did. Before too long, he was down in Egypt knocking on their door. And by 597 B.C., he was in the city of Jerusalem, the apple of God's eye. And now he was the undisputed king of the whole world. He was so successful, so successful, that everybody remembers his name to this day in almost every culture on the face of the planet. Undisputed. He's one of the most successful men in all of history. And now after huge success on the battlefield, after an impressive reconstruction program in the city of Babylon, fixing up all the damage that had been caused by the Assyrians, he was proud of what he had accomplished. And he accomplished a lot. He rebuilt the old temples which had been laying in ruins and he revived pride in Babylonian religion to the point where they began to name their captives after the Babylonian gods, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. He rebuilt the royal palace. His dad had a nice one. He made it even better, and he decked it out with gold and silver and cedar and stuff that even the kings of other nations could not afford. Everybody marveled at the palace that he lived in. He built the city wall. It's legendary. You've heard about the city walls in every evangelistic campaign you've ever gone to. So high, no army could possibly hope to scale them. So thick, three layers thick, that nobody could ever tunnel through them. And when it was done, everyone inside the city felt secure. We sit as a queen they said. He built an underground tunnel under the Euphrates River. We're still not quite sure how he pulled that off. He re-engineered a bridge over the Euphrates River inside the city, so specially constructed that the pillars under the bridge slowed down the water so that it would not erode the foundations of the city. It was incredible what he built. Then one day his wife came into his throne room, said, Nebi, I'm not sure she actually called him Nebi. That probably would have cost her her life back in those days. But Nebi, I love this city that we're living in, Babylon. Isn't it beautiful, honey? Yes, it's gorgeous. There's just one little problem. And her face fell a little bit. Man, you know exactly what that feels like. Just one little thing. What is it, honey? Well, I'm from Persia. You remember Persia, Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, yeah, I remember Persia. It's beautiful too. But this is a nice city, isn't it? It's better than anything you had over there. Oh, the city's wonderful. It's just this one little thing. Over in Persia, we had these beautiful snow-capped mountains. And I remember them, and I miss them so much. And here in Babylon, we are sitting on the plains. It is so flat, you can watch your dog run away for three weeks. And I just miss my mountains. He said, no problem, I'll build you a mountain. And he did. He built a mountain right in the middle of the city. Became the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Folks, when people say that ancient Babylon was a wonder of the world, it's almost an understatement. There's nothing today that compares to it. Not the Taj Mahal, not Machu Picchu, not the Roman Forum, not the Acropolis. Nothing compares to the gorgeous beauty of the city of ancient Babylon. He accomplished more than most people think. And he's rightfully proud. Now it's time to rest. 
At the end of his career, he did what any of us might do, reach around and pat himself on the back. And honestly, what really is wrong with that? What's wrong with knowing that you've done well? We do that. I get to the end of a project, I look back on it, and I go, that went really well. Give yourself a little pat on the back. What's wrong with that? Is it wrong to know that you've done well at what you tried to do? Probably not. I mean, we have a whole section in the card aisle for people who did well. We congratulate them at the end of their career. It's probably not wrong in and of itself, except for the fact that the Bible says the moment he uttered a word of self-congratulations, he loses his mind. Daniel chapter 4, if you have your Bible. Now, we're going to jump in at the end of the story. What I'm about to do is bad chronology. You'll have to go back and read the rest of the story later today. And I've only got one point. That's also bad homiletics. You're supposed to have three points in a prayer. Every student of homiletics knows that. But I've got one point in bad chronology for you this morning. Jumping in at the end, Daniel 4 and verse 29. At the end of the 12 months, see, it's the end of the story. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? He's back on the roof of his palace, thinking back over his entire life. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, do you remember that fourth grade teacher who used to mutter when he was grading your homework, saying this kid is as dumb as a bag of potatoes, and he wouldn't even be in the school if his dad wasn't the king? Remember that teacher? You showed him. Look at what you've accomplished. Remember your 11th grade homeroom teacher, Nebuchadnezzar? The one who sat you down on the last day of school and said, I've got a question for you. You better learn this because it's going to serve you well in your career. What is it, teacher? Well, the the question you need to learn to ask a lot is, would you like fries with that? Because that is all you're qualified for for the rest of your life. Remember that teacher? You showed him too. One of those teachers is now teaching in a backwater school out in a swampy village on the frontier, and the other one died in a battle with the Libyans. You showed them all. Look at what you've done. Look at what you've accomplished. Let's be honest. Doesn't he deserve some kind of reward after everything that he's done? We still give out the equivalent of a gold watch today to people when they do well with their career. He accomplished a lot. So what exactly has he done wrong? I'll tell you what it is, and that's my one point this morning, and we could be done. You can go. He did not accomplish the one thing God asked him to do. That's it. If you use this one life God has granted you to accomplish everything and anything except the one thing God has put you in this world to do, then you might be a a success by worldly standards, folks, but you're an utter failure in the eyes of God. You've wasted the one life that you've had because you were disobedient. No sooner has he finished congratulating himself than a voice comes from heaven. That's it, Nebuchadnezzar. I've had it. You're done. There's only a handful of examples in the Bible where there's a voice straight from heaven. Only a handful. And usually it means we all need to pay attention because on those occasions God is not speaking through the voice of a prophet and he is not using the written word. He's just opening the heavens and speaking for himself. And usually when that happens, it has universal application. It happens at the baptism of Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He announces Jesus himself. It happens at the Ten Commandments. God spoke all these words saying, when God speaks directly from heaven, you should probably pay attention. And this is one of those occasions. It's going to be important. It's not small. Verse 31 of Daniel 4. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. What do you mean, Lord? But this is mine. I worked hard my whole life. I built this. What do you mean? I'm going to lose my king. Oh, that is not all you are going to lose, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 32. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. Nebuchadnezzar, don't don't you understand what's happening? Nobody in this empire cares. They're not loyal to you. They don't care what's going to happen. You are not as influential as you think you are. Once you have outlived your usefulness to these people, they're going to take you and put you out in a field. That's one of life's most painful lessons. Most people in this world only have use for you as long as you're useful. And then they don't care. Nebuchadnezzar, don't you understand what's about to happen? 
They're going to take you and put you in a pasture. They're not going to put you in a hospital. There's not going to be a pretty nurse who comes and feeds you applesauce three times a day. You're not going to get a sponge bath twice a week. You're not going to get a corner suite at Johns Hopkins with a 42-inch plasma TV to watch while you recuperate. You're going to get, they're going to put you in the pasture because you've wasted it. You threw it away. You didn't use what I gave you the way that I intended. Don't you understand, Nebuchadnezzar? I am the reason that you have this empire, and I am the only thing that you actually have have and I'm not going to force you into my kingdom but if you don't want me you've got nothing I have tried to get your attention I gave you a dream that showed you your empire would not last you are the head of gold but it doesn't last forever and the only empire that does is the stone that crushes the statue I tried to get your attention I showed up and I walked through the fiery flames when you tried to burn my servants I tried and I tried and I tried to get your attention and if you don't want me that's okay I'm not going to force you but the problem is at the end of your life you've got nothing else nothing else One day we all learn, don't we? That eventually it all passes away. It all goes. Comes to an end. The last dollar's made. The last property's been purchased. The last romance has ended. The last campaign has been won or lost. The last bet has been placed. The last drink has been served. The last lie has been told. And it's over. And what do you have when it's over? They shall drive you, verse 32, from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it, listen carefully, gives it to whomever He chooses. At the pinnacle of His career, the king becomes an animal. Now, why would God do that? that? That seems a little harsh to me. Well, why is God being so hard on him? Why do that? I mean, he's just doing what most human beings do. Is it because of pride? I mean, that's the easy answer. And there is some pride here. He's speaking with the voice of Lucifer. This is my kingdom that I built. Pride is there, and there's no question about it, but there's something else in this story that you should probably pay attention to. I think there's something beyond pride. I think there's actually a message here for God's last day remnant church. Follow me carefully this morning. Back in Daniel chapter 2, we meet Nebuchadnezzar for the first time. and I mean, at least in the book of Daniel. He shows up in Jeremiah. He shows up in 2 Chronicles. But in the book of Daniel, he shows up for the first time, really, in person in Daniel chapter 2. And when we meet him, he's laying in a puddle of sweat in the middle of the night and his heart is pounding so hard that he can feel it in the tips of his ears and he's afraid. The man who's afraid of nothing is afraid of a dream. And you remember the story. You've heard it so many times. Daniel walks in and explains the dream to him. Daniel 2 verse 37. Listen carefully to these words. It's so simple and yet so profound. You, O king, Daniel 2 37, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. Who gave Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom? What is the real secret of his success? You do not want to miss this point. I know it's an obvious point, but you don't want to miss it. God gave Nebuchadnezzar his Neo-Babylonian empire. It's what the Bible says, and he did it on purpose. He had a design for that king. He had a plan for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to be a servant of the Most High God. Let your mind wrap around that for a moment. He's not just some pagan king who's a problem for the children of Israel. The Bible calls him a servant of God. He doesn't know it yet, but that's what he's supposed to be. He's not some foreign godless invader who gets lucky and manages to sneak past the angels and take the city of Jerusalem. God let him do it. This pagan king who ruthlessly conquers the world and burns down the temple in Jerusalem and kills the children of Zedekiah right in front of him and puts out the king's eyes and leads thousands of God's children captive, that guy somehow is also chosen by God. And that is not a comfortable idea. I don't like it one bit. I don't like it at all. It's so much easier to divide the human race into us and them. (laughs) 
these are God's people over here and these are clearly not God's people over there. It's so much easier to divide the human race like that. But look at what the Bible says. In this story, the chosen people of God are dragged away in chains and a pagan, idol-worshiping king is told by a Hebrew prophet, God gave you this kingdom. That upsets my way of thinking. I don't like it. It's mind-boggling, but the lesson is clear. God will work with whomever he needs to to bring about his kingdom. God will work with whoever he wants to to save a world lost in sin. God's purposes for his son's kingdom will never be thwarted by our refusal to cooperate with him. God uses whoever he wants. Now, when you first meet Nebuchadnezzar, it's pretty obvious he's lost. And this is not a man who's ready for translation by a long shot. He's still worshiping idols and he's killing people. He's arrogant. He's full of pride. But when you read the whole story and you see the way that God patiently labors with this man and you see the way that this stubborn king eventually softens and gives his heart to Jesus and then you hear the words in the Bible. Read Jeremiah 27. You read the words in the Bible that say that God raised him up and gave him that kingdom. It's pretty obvious that God's chosen people are not only found among the genetic descendants of Abraham. That's pretty obvious in the Bible. Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, not a descendant of Abraham. Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute, not a descendant of Abraham. Ruth, the Moabites, not a literal descendant of Abraham. God will use whoever he wants. He's got his children in every nation, tribe, tongue, and people on the face of the earth. And he's given us one job. My people come out of Babylon. He calls them his people. And our job is to go and get them and bring them home. That's it. But if you and I won't do it, if we won't do what God asks, he'll find someone who will. I never, ever forget there were candidates for the prophetic office before Ellen White said yes, and they said no. God uses who he wants. Now God uses Nebuchadnezzar because, frankly, Israel blew it. She failed to be a light to the world, failed to be a light to the Gentiles, and so God moves to another plan. He finds another position of influence, another person of influence who will get the word out because God's work will not be stopped by our indifference. God's work will not be stopped because we choose to put different items on our agenda. The Israelites were supposed to be a light to the world. God put them in the crossroads of the ancient world where all the highways that went from one continent to another passed right by the temple in Jerusalem and people could see the sacrifices and ask the questions, what does that lamb represent? But in the end, God's people are so completely unfaithful that they're willing to put their children in the arms of a red-hot idol named Molech and burn them to death. And the devil must be laughing because any day now, one of those firstborn children put in that idol's arms might just be the promised Messiah. So what does God do? He sends him back home. Where does he send them? He sends him to Chaldea. That's where Abraham came from. And with every step on the way back to Nebuchadnezzar's empire, it is deeply embarrassing. It's not any country that conquers Jerusalem. It's where they came from. It's Chaldea. And with every embarrassing step, the defective bride is being sent back home. And God picks another influential Chaldean to get the attention of the world, a man who is nothing like Abraham. In fact, he's still worshiping Terah's gods. And then he expects Nebuchadnezzar to do something for him because, listen to me carefully, God does not favor people. God does not raise people up for no particular reason. There is always something that they are being called to do. If God has called you, there is something you're supposed to be doing for his kingdom. And what is it with Nebuchadnezzar? Daniel chapter 4, verse 11. Listen to this. He's described as a tree that is meant to feed the world. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar is the tree, and the ends of the earth is where God's message was always supposed to go, and it's still supposed to go, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Let it sink in. Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to be a light to the world. It didn't happen by accident. 
It wasn't happening in Jerusalem, so maybe it could happen in Babylon of all places. Nebuchadnezzar, you, you think, do you think I gave you this kingdom by accident? Do you think that we were just bored in heaven and so I called the angels in with a globe and I said, spin the globe, Gabriel, and just close your eyes and drop your finger on some nation and we'll just bless that one next. Do you think this is by accident? God always favors us for a reason. There is always a reason he gives us what we have. There is always a reason. And it makes you wonder why the remnant church is born in the most prosperous nation on earth. Also makes you wonder why maybe the most prosperous nation on earth is sliding to its ruin so quickly. God gives this remnant church favor for a reason. There is only one thing we were supposed to do. Be a tree that feeds the world. The children were supposed to be, the children of Israel were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles and they wouldn't do it. So God sends them to Babylon. I mean, they wanted to live like Babylonians anyway, may as well go home. And when they get there, he shows them what they were supposed to do. He shows them what was always possible. Well, they're out working in the fields and digging in the mines and laboring like slaves for their Babylonian overlords. God uses a young, humble Hebrew prophet to go into the throne room of the most unlikely man on earth and he becomes a believer. A ruthless pagan is given the job Israel was supposed to do. And by the end of the story, Nebuchadnezzar is singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Listen, Daniel 3, 3 verse, uh, 4, verse 34. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. That's not the song of Moses and the Lamb, Sean. Yes, it is. Compare it to Revelation 15. Just and true are your ways, O king of saints, for all nations shall come and worship before you. Your judgments have been manifested. Nebuchadnezzar is singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. The pagan king is fulfilling the gospel commission. It's just like Jesus said on one occasion, do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham for a father, for I can raise up children of Abraham out of these stones. One way or another, God's going to get the message out. I don't know about you, but I'd like to be among the group that's doing that work. I want to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Listen to me very carefully. God raised up this church for a reason. This is not just another denomination. This is not just one more expression of Christianity. This is not just a side note, an item of interest in the long development of Christianity. Not at all. We have been raised up by God to do something very specific and to say something very specific and to be something very specific. And if we lose our way, if we lose sight of the fact that this is a prophetic movement of believers, if we lose sight of the fact that the world is supposed to find very specific spiritual food in the branches of this tree, if we forget the mission and the message that God gave us when he raised us up, then we may be in danger of losing our minds too. We'll have let go of the one reason God raised us up. Do, do you mind if I ask some tough questions this morning? Don't look so grim. They're not going to be that bad. No. But I think we're running out of time. So let me ask the questions. If a stranger were to stand outside the door of your church board with a glass to the door and listen, eavesdrop, over the next hour and a half, would they be able to tell what the God-given mandate of this church is? If you gave the agenda for your church business meeting to an outsider, would that person be able to tell what the number one priority of the church is? Would it be obvious to those people that we have a burden for the lost? I, I've never been a fan of poetry. I hate poetry. I heard an amen. Amen. <laughs> There's one po poem I like. I like Lord Byron's poem. Go figure, the one poem that I like is written by a hedonist, <laughs> a lost man. But you know, the, you know the Lord Byron poem? She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright, meet in her aspect, in her eye. There, there's a reason I like that, because I tried that on a girl about 27 years ago, and we've been married now for 23. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some merit to some of it. As a rule, I hate it, though. I do remember, you know, after last night, you're going to think, this guy hated everything in school, and that's pretty close to the truth. Huh? 
I do remember my first exposure to the, pro, uh, to the prophet, to the poet, I need to be clear, John Donne, the English poet. I was sitting in, I don't know, 11th grade English class, and the teacher was going on. It was one of those lectures, on and on and on and on ad nauseum. And we didn't have Twitter and Facebook, and we didn't have any way to escape that classroom except our imaginations. And so in my imagination, I was on a beach somewhere while he was going on and on and on. about. And then about 40 minutes into his lecture, suddenly an ambulance went right by our high school. Woo, woo, that's more of a European ambulance, but you get the drift. He went right by our high school, and he stopped, and he walked over to to the window and he looked outside. It was merciful, this break in his lecture. And I'll never forget, he muttered some words. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Now we're curious, what in the world does that mean? And he looked up, now we're trapped. He saw that we were paying attention and he seized the teachable moment. He started up again. <laughs> Boys, that's a poem by John Donne. Oh. He wrote that right after he survived a hard illness and thought he was going to die. Oh, now we're paying attention. If the poet's about to die, that might be a good story. <laughs> Poem about death. He recited the whole thing. You probably know it. No man is an island entire unto himself. Each man's death diminishes me. For I'm involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Might be, I don't know, 35 years ago. But I remember like it was yesterday, he stopped and said, you know, everybody used to live in a small village. I'd seen that. All my folks grew up in small villages in the Netherlands, and there's one church in the middle of town, a cluster of houses around it. And any time he said they rang the bell, you stopped what you were doing because something bad had happened, and chances were you knew whoever was hurt. And he said, John Dunn is saying when the bell rings, don't ask who it's for because it's for all of us. We all lose when somebody dies. We're all part of the human race. When somebody takes a hit from death, we all take a hit. And don't you boys ask who's out there riding in that ambulance. Don't you understand? It's you. Every time you hear that siren go, it's you. It's the whole human race being beat up by death one more time. We're all in this together, he said. You can't just say, oh, I'm glad that's not me because in some way it is. It is. We've all been made in the image of God. We all come from the same source of life. And somebody dies without Christ, we all lose. Heaven loses. Jesus told the story of the Pharisees and the tax collectors. Remember that? Pharisees praying big and loud. Oh, Lord, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers. He didn't get it. He is like that other man. And if that other man dies in his sins, we all lose. And, and the uncomfortable thought, too, because we like to pick on the Pharisees, but the uncomfortable thought, if the Pharisee dies in his sins, we all lose. Heaven loses, and a piece is ripped out of the heart of God. Somebody dies, they're lost. I wonder what would happen, thinking of John Donne, if every time somebody went down to a Christless grave, we could actually hear a bell ring. Siren would go by, shaking us out of our daydreams every time another member of the human race is lost. What if we could hear it? Ding. Ding. That would be a lot faster than that. Promise you heaven hears it. More than that, they, they feel it because they know what Jesus paid for that person. Most days, we don't even think about them. We even sanitize the way we talk about the lost because it's so negative. We don't want to use that word anymore in the 21st century. That's too negative. So we talk about people like they're misinformed or spiritually impoverished, and they'd probably be happier and better adjusted if they came through the doors of our church. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they're lost. If they're just misinformed, Jesus would only need to be a teacher. If they're just maladjusted, Jesus would just have to be a positive-thinking guru. But God saw we were dying in our sins, and so he sent a Savior. We can't afford to misjudge for a second how expensive it is for someone to be lost. And I know that we don't want to say anymore in the 21st century that there's only one way to heaven, but it is what the Bible teaches. But pastor, we know there will be people in heaven who have never heard the name of Jesus. That is absolutely true. Romans chapter 2, Zephaniah, what are those scars in your hands? Those are true statements, but you don't build your theology on the exceptions. You build your theology on the rule, and God says that if people go to a Christless grave, they are lost. That is a child of God that is lost to the kingdom of heaven forever. Let me ask you, how often do we even think about them? 
in the General Conference building. I'll pick on the GC for a minute. <laughs> I was working there, and at night when I was coming out of my office, I'd stop in the atrium, and some of you who have been there have seen the atrium. And, and I would stand on the west side, and I would look at the east side, and on the east side, there are a whole bunch of meeting rooms. They're in glass, so you can see what's going on in there. And I'd pause, and I'd watch everybody meeting for a moment. And, 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 and there are four meeting rooms across stacked three deep. It, it almost looks like the display at Petco, like all the fish tanks. And I would have this urge to lift a lid and shake in fish food for those poor people that had an evening committee meeting. And, and I would watch, and as I stood there, I would remember distinctly the feeling I had the day I realized I was lost and Christless. Now, they're busy in there. Those are good people. I'm not really picking on the GC. Those people have hearts of gold, and they work hard, and they, uh, it's a delight to watch our church moving forward all around the world. It really is. But I would sit there, and I would think about all the meetings that take place all over this country, the union committees, the conference committees, the church boards that meet every month, Sabbath school classes, the meeting around your dinner table Sabbath afternoon, and I just wonder how often do the lost make it into the discussion? Jesus came to seek and to save them. How often do we talk about them? How often? I read this story a while ago about a kid in Gary, Indiana. His parents split up in 2009. So he had to go live with his dad and his stepmom, and it was an awful existence. They treated him like a dog, and I don't mean figuratively. They made him sleep in a cage in the basement. And one day, a sister came down, 2009, found him unconscious on a dirty mattress, and she couldn't revive him. Didn't know how anyway. So she told her step-parents, step-mom, dad. And they didn't call the police. They didn't call a funeral home. They just wrapped the body in a plastic bag and disappeared for a few days. When they came back, their clothes were muddy. And they said, well, we've encased him in concrete. He'll never come back. And she said, but what if somebody asks? We'll just say he ran away from home. Look at this place. Everyone will believe that. You know, the problem was nobody asked. For two years, nobody asked. No one at school noticed he was missing. None of the family noticed that he was missing. Nobody noticed that he was missing. And you've got to wonder, how do the lost become so unimportant? The only way we know is that the sister finally broke down and said something. Nobody asked. How do lost people become so unimportant? If we could get transcripts of all of our meetings... And just print them out and take a ruler and measure the space given for the one thing Jesus asked us to do. How much would there be? Some, I don't know, 20, no, 30 some years ago now, I was living in this apartment. It looked so good in the brochure. It was the executive apartments. And I was so excited as a young man, I'm going to live in the executive apartments. What a dump this place was. I I signed up without looking at it, and I was so excited and naive, and I remember looking out my window, there was a guy sleeping in our dumpster, and I was a little jealous because his bed was better than the one I had on the inside. And, and there was a soccer field next to our apartment, and there was a mom playing there one day, and she turned her back for just a moment, and her little boy, four or five years old, disappeared. She turned back, he was gone. And I remember they, they rounded us all up in the neighborhood. We went everywhere calling out his name, Michael! I don't know why the case got so big, but that kid made it all over milk cartons all over North America. You've seen his picture, I guarantee it. I don't know what they suspected was behind it, but it went nationwide just like that. And I noticed over the weeks that the search party grew smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the other day it occurred to me, I haven't thought about this kid in 30 years. They never found him. We forgot. I'll tell you who didn't forget. His mom. Can a woman forget her nursing child, God says? Not have compassion on the son of her womb? Oh, they might forget, but I will not forget you, says God, for I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. If only we could hear a bell ring every time a human being goes to their grave without Jesus. If only we heard it every time somebody was lost. I wonder how that might change the business of our church. We, we don't have a bell. That doesn't happen. 
So I've sometimes wondered if every time we prayed, if we didn't insert a minute of silence in that prayer, if that wouldn't help. Just to think about who's not home yet. I wonder if that minute of silence wouldn't become an iron band around the stump of our tree and brings us back to life. A very successful, a very influential man has come to the end of his long and successful career. It's time to sit back and enjoy the fruits of his labor, and honestly, this man has earned it. He's so successful that when he gets up in the morning and looks out of his bedroom window, he owns everything that he can see. He literally cannot see past the bounds of his own property, and that's not because he's living on some big spread in the state of Texas, as impressive as that would be. It's small potatoes compared to what this man owns. He could get on a horse that afternoon, and he could travel in any direction direction literally forever and never leave the bounds of his property because this man is Jesus Christ, the man who conquered the universe with his unbeatable love and a cross. And on one particular morning, he heads out in his kingdom to find someone he knows very well. And he finds him walking at rest on the roof of his palace in the new Jerusalem, marveling at everything he sees. And as Jesus approaches, he can hear this man murmur, is not this great Jerusalem that God has built? And then the man feels a hand on his shoulder. He doesn't even have to look. He knows who it is. It's Jesus. And he looks up and he sees a scar on that hand. He said, how did that happen? Oh, that's right, Nebuchadnezzar, you don't know that story. This happened in the house of my friends. This is how I saved you. And they sit down and Jesus tells them the story of Calvary. And tears fill the pagan king's eyes as he realizes once and for all just how expensive heaven really is. Turns out Jesus really did go to the fiery furnace after all. Imagine, he says, I thought Babylon was great. He falls quiet, looks across the city for a moment, and then there are more tears in his eyes. How did you know, Jesus? Why didn't you just give up on me? Because I knew it, Nebuchadnezzar, from the moment you were born, I knew it. I knew that if I could get your attention, I could save you. And I was so desperate to have you here with me that I sent my whole nation to come and get you. I wanted to find you when you were lost and sitting here in this city right now. It seems to me, Nebuchadnezzar, like it was worth the price. Imagine, if you can, the king of Babylon at home in heaven. If God has given us what we have, it's for a reason. It's time to go get another one because we are running out of time. I happen to know that when Gene and I went to an evangelistic meeting about a quarter century ago, that the pastor of that church, God bless him, had to argue with the church board about whether or not it was worth it. I'd like to hold a little evangelistic meeting. That's not worth it, pastor. Those are expensive and it's a lot of hard work and I don't know about the results. Like, you know what, folks? Like the results would let us off the hook anyway. Noah preached for 120 years without a single convert and we all know he would have been sinning if he'd stopped preaching. I am so glad the pastor pushed them and prevailed because I'm going to get to sit in the kingdom of heaven and see the scars in his hands too. Don't let anybody talk you out of the one thing God asked us to do. They're not all home yet or Jesus would be here. We're not finished yet. There's another one waiting. It's time to go and get them. Father in heaven, as we draw to the close of this hour, lay somebody on our hearts. Give us eyes to see the community the way that you see it. 
We're so blinded to what's going on around us, but we have faith this morning that you are at work in homes up and down our streets. Teach us to see those people the way you see them. Teach us to appreciate how long you've labored for them and give us the courage to just invite them home. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.